the film that was released in 2005 focusing on the GSE West Ham's football firm. It's one of many football firm movies, football violence. It doesn't depict football in a great way, but will. It's an interesting film nonetheless. Yeah, good evening. And it's a football film that features football, I think, for about four, maybe five minutes during the film. Uh, we never actually get the big mill wall against West Ham showdown, which we're expecting in the end. That's almost like a sideshow uh, just to set up the final fight between the two firms. It's very clear that this is a movie that wasn't made by football fans. This was a movie made by a German filmmaker, Levi Alexander, who wrote the story, a German woman. And she felt that there were redeeming factors to be found in the idea of the firms and the idea of being, I guess, faithful to the people around you. And that's the message here. It's uh, not just that your friends will have your back, but there's almost something in having the back of your friends. And that's kind of the abiding message. And that's what Elijah Wood's character is meant to learn. And we have Frodo goes to football. That's ultimately what Green Street is. The one thing I would say in a positive sense, because we are going to bash the hell out of this movie, I would imagine, over the next 20 minutes or so, is that I rewatched it this morning. It's an hour and 42 minutes long. And those hour and 42 minutes actually fly by. It's actually still an enjoyable enough watch. You will be cringing and probably laughing at most of it, uh, but it is pretty easy. It flies by, Enda. Yeah, well, this is a film that I've watched countless times, almost an embarrassingly amount of times, because it was just something my, me and my brother would sit down and watch on a, on a Saturday evening if there was nothing else to do. It did come out in 2005, and like you said, Frodo Baggins goes to a football match. This, this was Elijah Wood's third film after the Lord of the Rings franchise, it was a weird, of, it was sort of a back step more than a forward step in his acting career. Yeah, you'd have to wonder what his agent was thinking. Maybe he felt that he was getting involved in this kind of gritty project and that he was going to go over to the UK and shoot this. And I'm sure he had to be very aware coming out of Lord of the Rings. And you've got to be thinking, I don't want to be typecast. Like, I'm now Frodo Baggins in everybody's mind. And even when he did Sin City, he tried to kind of move away from that. He played a bad guy in Sin City, who was also a mute, and it was a very different type of character to Frodo Baggins. I think he was trying to just, you know, basically change his career around a bit. Like Elijah Wood, when you think about it, will always be remembered for Lord of the Rings. And subsequently, he hasn't done a huge amount of huge projects after that. And I think this was probably an attempt on his part where I'm sure when he looked at this screenplay, it looked a little bit gritty, a little bit interesting. And then you kind of see the clangor it turned out to be when it was eventually filmed and put up on screen. And I actually think a large part of it isn't down to Elijah Wood. Elijah Wood is probably one of the best parts about the movie in terms of just a purely acting point of view. The acting issue is probably far more with a guy who goes on to have a lot of fame uh, with Sons of Anarchy later on, and that's Charlie Hunnam, who definitely puts on the worst Essexy London accent you will ever hear. Like his Mockney Cockney is just so awful. This is up there definitely with like Sean Connery trying to do an accent that's not Scottish. It's just awful. Yeah, and I suppose focusing on Elijah Wood for the time being, a lot of actors struggle with that sort of typecasting when they've been in such a famous franchise. If you look at the likes of Daniel Radcliffe, he took a real weird left step after the Harry Potter franchise when he went into some sort of like horror and now he's working on, on stage plays in London. So how, how difficult is it for those characters to get away from that? Because even if you look at some of the more comedy side uh, of acting, the likes of Steve Carell will always be Michael from The Office. So. Elijah Wood doesn't do a bad job in this movie. Like he, for a second or two, you do forget that he was Frodo. Yeah, look, I mean, it's a perfectly serviceable performance. You think around that kind of uh, just after Lord of the Rings period, he's in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, uh, where he plays the ever so slightly creepy love interest for Kay Winslet's character, where he's using her own information against her in an attempt to get with her, which is going away from type. And here he's trying to play... An American that I suppose we're meant to sympathize with because he gets screwed over in the early stages of the movie uh, by his housemate, who's an absolute asshole. And he's that kind of preppy Harvard guy who eventually dumps the fact that he had cocaine in their dorm room onto Elijah Wood's character, Matt. And then Matt ends up having to leave college. He's almost too embarrassed about it to tell his family, doesn't tell his dad, who's a journalist at the Times in England, but seems to kind of jet set around the Middle East to cover stories, a far more glamorous journalist than most of us know and his sister has married into a family in London so he gets onto a flight in Boston goes across to London and this is how it's set up for him to be a character that we're meant to care about I'm not sure 
how sympathetic it really is, this idea of him leaving college and deciding not to actually appeal against the decision because he's afraid of the influence that his prep boy uh, friend who he was staying with in the dorm room is actually meant to be. Uh, but this is what we get. Elijah Wood's character goes across to the UK turns up into London and realistically, I think within a day, maybe less, I think it's the night that he arrives, he ends up going to a football game at West Ham in the championship and ends up getting involved with the firm. It all kind of moves along very quickly. Yeah, I think the uh, the first scene where he arrives in London, he I think it's the following day after he gets a good night's sleep that he goes out to a game, but the before he arrives in London, you see a fight between the West Ham fans and the Spurs fans in the Tube uh, in London. And the city's sort of in a mess when he arrives. There's uh, phone boxes, smashed glass all over the ground. And he asks his sister, "What was there a terrorist attack in the in the city centre?" And she turns around, "No, it was uh, Sunday football madness." It's just, <laughs> it's sort of, it's such an Americanized version of this world that they're trying to depict straight away. Yeah, it's kind of funny as well, Ended, because you've got this situation where it's normalised as if this violence happens on every single weekend and as if there's a London derby every week and all, one of the London teams has gone to the other side of the city and therefore there was just gang violence and the police just come in and sweep up afterwards. And like surveillance is one of those things that's kind of a heavily, uh, hugely heavy theme because we get these shots where they go back out to the security footage of what's happening uh, within the fights and yet it seems to take the police an absolute eternity to turn up to any of them, particularly uh, that scrap that we'll probably talk about in Manchester between the United fans and the West Ham fans. Uh, like there's surveillance everywhere. It's outside of a train station. You would imagine that there would be security at the train station. And yet it seems to take an absolute eternity for the police to arrive. It's almost like uh, from the writing point of view, there's this acceptance that this kind of uh, violence just happens on a regular basis and that it's a way of actually sorting out arguments legitimately. And it's heavily romanticized as well. Like usually when it comes to these uh, movies, even if you look at, you know, say Football Factory, which is, you know, a little bit more gritty even than this, there is that kind of feeling that it's all for nothing and that at least there's a moral lesson to be learned that, you know, these men are going out and wasting their time and should be looking for something else to do. There's actually a feeling, I think, in Green Street that there's moral lessons to be taken from fighting and that it's actually a good thing, um, which I think is a very strange message. It's not one that you're going to see in many of these hooligan movies. Yeah, and that was a purposely done thing by the director who I watched uh, how, how this film was made a few years ago and she was basically saying that she wanted to show that these are normal people. So you see the likes of... Uh, Pete Dunham getting off his seat and letting a pregnant woman sit down uh, on the tube, and then he's a, he's a school teacher, and they all go about normal lives. One of them is a, I think he's a pilot or he works for he the is, airport, yeah. and they normalise these people. And she wanted that was done purposely so that you could see that there are other sides to these people and that they're softer people inside. But again, like you said, they don't really condemn the violent side of these people. No, and like some of these characters that we meet during the story, you mentioned the fact that, you know, their mate who basically gives them the tip off, I think his name is David uh, in Manchester, is a pilot. He seems very successful and he's in his pilot's uniform uh, when the rest of the firm arrive for the game. Uh, you've got Steve, who, you know, we'll eventually talk about, you know, who turns out to be the guy that was basically the founder of the firm that they're in. And he seems to be a very successful businessman. He's got this, you know, very attractive American wife. He's got his kids. He's got his kids set up and seems to live in quite a nice area. And then you've got these working class guys who are kind of the foot soldiers, effectively, uh, within the Green Street elite. It's kind of strange. It's almost like they made a very conscious decision to say, right, these are people who live normal lives. And even Pete, it turns out, is a PE and history teacher within the school. Uh, it's like, it's kind of unusual the way they, they do it because Pete, when we first meet him, is trying to borrow 100 quid to go to the pub. And yet it turns out he has a full-time teaching gig and probably has a reasonable amount of money. Uh, there's definitely that kind of conflict between, usually we're talking about like young working class men. That's definitely how they seem at the very start. And then very quickly you see there's actually people in quite respectable jobs who are taking part in this firm. Whether that's realistic to life, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, so let's talk about Pete. Pete Dunham, he's the up-and-coming head officer, if you want to say, from in the GSE, the Green Street Elite, the West Ham f football firm. He's Steve Dunham's brother, who used to be the major of the firm, the founder of the firm, essentially. 
We first meet him in the opening scene where, like you said, he's coming to borrow money. He's this cocky, arrogant, um, bravado Englishman from London with a terrible London Cockney accent. Charlie Hunnam, this is an early day Charlie Hunnam. It's before Sons of Anarchy, it's before The Gentleman. He's really taken off in the last couple of years. But this is sort of early days and this is not one of his best roles. No, it, like it's a strange piece of casting. I mean, obviously they've decided to pick Charlie Hunnam because of his looks at this point. You know, there's quite a few torso shots. There's uh, those unnecessary walking through the apartment uh, while putting on the top shots that happen later on in the movie. And he's there to be a sympathetic character. You know, at the end, you've got Elijah Wood's character saying, this is the guy I want to emulate. You know, I want to live the rest of my life in almost like in the way that Pete lived his. Uh, he's taken over from his brother as the head of the firm. Uh, you know, we kind of get the the tell not show moments where it's like, oh, he was involved in this legendary dust up that happened in Manchester. And uh, he was involved in the original Mill One One where we're going to see the revenge for it later on in the movie. And you know, Pete, for the best part, is he seems to be liked by pretty much everybody within the firm. And he decides at a fairly early stage, it's like we get this kind of strange moment where we've this mini almost half fight between Matt and Pete early on. And it's almost the fact that Pete doesn't get a no from Matt about going to the game. That means that within moments he's like, right, you're coming to the match, come on, you're going to become part of my firm. And then he obviously leads things in a fairly kind of passive way. He has an awareness, of, somewhat of an awareness about uh, Matt's background and the fact that, you know, his dad was a journalist. I'm sure he had to have suspicions, um, you know, considering that the two things they really hate are the police, other firms and journalists. And they say that frequently. It's like, oh, journals, journals are worse of the worst. And it's like he obviously then decides to protect Elijah Wood's character throughout the rest of the movie, uh, despite the fact that he's warned on numerous occasions uh, throughout that there could be potentially issues there. And it puts him, look, in direct conflict with Bover as well, who will eventually effectively betrays like the Judas character who then redeems himself afterwards within the gang, is that almost his relationship between Matt and Pete is what puts Pete into trouble throughout the entire film. Yeah, and what do we make of the general flow of the movie? Because there are several key scenes, like the fight scenes, and then the different reveals where Bover double crosses the GSC, etc., and stuff like that. But the general feel of the film, I thought, was actually quite good. Like if you if you look at the the opening scene where they go to the the Abbey, the pub where they go to the, before the game, and just the shite that they're talking in it before <laughs> a football match with a few pints, it does encapsulate the sort of match day feel or the match day uh, preparation that people who frequent football matches in England would go through. Yeah, and like I actually, it, probably my favourite scene, I think, in the entire film is in the first third where we get West Ham going on to take on Birmingham and very clearly you've got the Birmingham fans who... They're obviously familiar with these uh, West Ham guys already. And you've got the Green Street crew who are pretty much in the first two rows watching the game. And then Bover manages to get himself uh, a steward's outfit. Um, he, I think he's got a media bib on and he's able to make his way over to the Birmingham crowd and he's able to wind them up, uh, which results in that kind of first action scene after that. Like, I really enjoyed the way that the football was presented. I thought it was presented really slickly, the West Ham against Birmingham footage. And then the Birmingham fans decide to try and jump Elijah Wood's character as he's leaving because it's very clear, even at this early stage, that there's tensions between the gang about having an American involved with them. He decides to leave, but it turns out that the Green Street guys have his back. And we get this kind of fairly interesting, very stylized, violent scene where there seems to be as well, with the exception of the final stages, Enda, if you think about it, there's very few repercussions for what actually happens. Like nobody gets that badly injured. People take some serious smacks in these fights where probably teeth should be uh, out of their mouth, where you'd imagine the jaws get dislocated. But yet everyone seems to brush it off. They feel a little bit rough. Um, two anodins the next morning and they're right back ready to fight again. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that somebody gets hit with a brick in that uh, scene as well and glass in the, in the face. So it's, it's an odd one. The violence is a weird one in this because the, there's a major plot hole in the fact that how, how the hell did they know where Matt was going to be at that point in time if he were to get jumped by a Birmingham crew? Unless they followed him. Uh, but I don't think they did. Like, there was no implication that actually, oh, yeah, go on, Matt, head down there and make sure you don't go to the train station at East Ham. But, you know, make sure you're all right. Like, unless they followed him, how did they get there quickly enough to prevent him getting that Chelsea smile, which the Birmingham guys were about to give him with the credit card? Like, I don't understand how they got on the scene that quickly. 
No, and then the following, like later on in the fight, where the other crew turn up at the fight to save the five or six men that followed Matt. It's, it's a major plot hole in the film that really annoyed me, but I suppose this type of film, there's always going to be plot holes. So as we go on the movie then, essentially what happens is that, uh, so Matt, he is, he's won the approval after that one fight uh, of most of the crew, except for Bover, who's the right-hand man. They don't trust him. He wins their approval by coming up with a plan. They're on their way to Manchester United and the Man United fans are waiting for them outside the train station. They stop the train. He comes up with a plan that they get into the back of a van and flank the Man Manchester United fans, which it was pretty good. It's a pretty novel scene, which, is, which was a, ni a nice addition to the film. So that wins Bover over slightly. But then Millwall come to town and he starts getting angsty. Yeah, and like that scene in Manchester is really entertaining because again, uh, the West Ham crew, like it's obviously funny the way that Bover hits the emergency sign and they get out in Mackles Field and then they have to, you know, commandeer away to Manchester and eventually it's Matt's character who has the pretty good idea to put them in the back of the van. He'll hide in the front and he pretends that they're filming a movie which has, I think they said it was Hugh Grant and Cameron Diaz and the guys seem impressed that Cameron Diaz might be in town and that was enough to cause the distraction for them to disperse and allow them to drive about five yards past the crew, stop, and then the Manchester guys don't seem to watch the van they don't turn around until the point that the West Ham crew have actually picked up some road signs and some other weapons that they can use in the fight. And even at that, like the West Ham crew are massively outnumbered. I think we're talking about like maybe seven or eight of them up against 50 or 60 guys. Yeah. And the Green Street crew seem to handle themselves reasonably well. I know they get the jump in the fight, but still, I don't know how they don't get overwhelmed. Uh, but yeah, that seems to be the point that Matt really gets into the crew. It's the point where Matt seems to actually enjoy the fighting because... Obviously, in the first row with the Birmingham guys, he's defending himself and he's in this desperate situation where he's trying to get out of there and he's scared and the guys come in to help him. In the Manchester one, he seems to really enjoy the vo the violence. And for a guy who doesn't like he look like he'd be able to you know, fight his way out of a wet paper bag in the early exchanges in the movie, uh, next thing Frodo is throwing punches all over the place and knocking people out. Like, it's amazing how a guy who they very clearly jokingly portrayed him as the karate kid in the pub at the start actually becomes quite useful with his hands with little or no training. It's an amazing transformation that happens in those few days between the two matches. Yeah, and after that fight, I think he, I can't remember the exact wording, but he essentially talks about how it's not about you having your friends back, it's about them having your back as well. And that's sort of the general overriding theme throughout this entire film. Um, just moving on to the, the bad guys, uh, Jeff Bell, Tommy Hatcher, the leader of the NTO, the Millwall firm. I think we've covered five films in this series, and of four of them, he has been the bad guy. <laughs> um, so he plays that character quite well and to be fair he is probably one of the best things about this film because he is properly gritty he is and like uh, he's Whacker Harris in uh, the film with uh, oh, Mike Bassett England manager too yeah. so that always jumps to my mind whenever I see him is a slightly younger version uh, playing the slightly psycho England centre half so he's as you mentioned he, like he's he pops up frequently in these football movies I'm guessing obviously his agent probably just passes on the DVD of whatever previous one he's been in and that helps him get cast but like he's perfectly cast here it, all, it also kind of reminded me in all of these movies Millwall always Always seem to be the bad guys like in football factory well, it's chelsea against millwall in this one it's west ham against millwall are they wrong though yeah look i suppose it probably plays into millwall's reputation i'm sure millwall fans probably take it as a you know a badge of appreciation the fact that they're always cast in this way but they're almost like the nazis of movies in the 60s and 70s they're always the bad guys uh, when it comes to football and we get that wonderfully kind of tense scene you know where bover decides to go across the city he finds himself on his motorbike going to a small cafe. He's having his various stereotypical jelly deals and mushy peas at the table. And then we kind of get this moment where the Millwall crew come in. And there is that like incredible sense of dread. And also that most of the people who are in the cafe are fairly familiar that this is a guy not to mess with. So they shut up pretty much at the point uh, that he begins to talk. And unfortunately, one woman who's at a table near to them, despite her boyfriend saying, uh, please be quiet or this is going to go badly. Uh, she says, hey, I'm not going to shut up for some guy who seems to be trying to threaten us. And unfortunately, her boyfriend gets his face caved in on the table as a result. So we kind of learn very early on that it's like, 
here's a guy who has a tragic story because of what's happened to his son and has every reason to be angry with the Green Street crew. But at the same time, he's slightly a psycho and he could go off at any point. And when he gets violent, he's unlikely to stop. So it's actually, that's a pretty clever piece of story writing that I think within one scene, we get a character down. And despite the slight nuances that might be there, we straight away know this is a guy not to mess with within about three minutes on screen. Yeah, and for some reason, Bobber decides to double-cross the GSE. It's still not really confirmed in my head why he did it. It's slightly out of jealousy of of Matt becoming best friends with Pete and rising to the top of the firm so quickly as a as a, an outsider, as a Yank. And it still doesn't really make sense to me, but essentially what he does is he goes over to Millwall and he tells uh, Tommy Hatcher that Steve Dunham is in the Abbey again because essentially what happens is Steve went down to save Pete because the crew had just found out that he was a journalism major. So that's a key point in this movie, that's a key turning point, that's something that would not be allowed in the firm as a, a journalism major in case he was an undercover journal as they think he is. So Bobber tells uh, Tommy Hatcher that he's in the pub and they rush over and uh, throw fire or throw sorry Molotov uh, in the cocktails, in, yeah. cocktails into the into the pub and they go in and stab Steve in the neck which leads to him almost dying this is all in the build up to Millwall playing West Ham in the FA Cup and before this big fight that's one of the most dramatic scenes in the film and it's probably brings together how deep this rivalry goes yeah, like we'll deal with probably maybe the kind of logical worries and concerns that I would have at this point about everything that happens in that kind of five minute period in the movie. So we get to a point where essentially Bobber comes across and gives the information, right? And he says, I can tell you that Steve is going to be at this pub at this time and you should attack. Now, the impression that I get is that the major since he's retired from the firm has actually climbed the corporate ladder and all impressions seem to be that he's a very successful businessman and he just comes back into the house and he's got a couple of hundred quid in cash, which he can just flip off at the start. He seems to live in a really nice spot and he's in good suits all the way throughout the movie. So the impression seems to be that since he's left the firm, he's done very well for himself. OK, why not just go to company house and find out what company he works for? Go to his place of work, wait for him and get him there. It's like... It's not as if this guy has been traveling around Southeast Asia and hiding from the Millwall firm for the last 20 years. He's been living and working in London in what appears to be a quite prominent position. So this idea that like, oh my God, we found out that he's in that pub where the rest of his firm very clearly drink and drink continually shouldn't really feel like that much of a revelation, but it seems to work. Yeah, Millwall guys... The idea that might be because Tommy Hatcher presumes he's back in the firm? Yeah, maybe. And maybe because he's back in the firm, he then becomes like okay to do a hit on. Like as in, if he's not in the gang, we can't actually come after him. Uh, despite the fact that like the major had very little to do with the death of the son when we see the flashback, it's actually the other guys in the firm as opposed to him. And he has the most horrible mullet during that. Oh, probably awful. the best thing probably the best thing that's happened in the 20 years aside from his business work is the haircut that he managed to get but yeah may, look maybe you're right maybe it's the fact that ah, he's back in with the firm so we can turn this into firm on firm violence as opposed to taking a guy out but still at the end of the film like, tommy has no problem with chasing down a car with the major's wife and kid and murdering the child in the back of a range rover so i'm not sure it nece they necessarily have some kind of moral system where he has to be killed within a fight but, yeah, I mean, we get that pretty dramatic scene within the bar where, you know, the Green Street crew are not prepared because they're already in fighting between themselves at the point that the rival gang arrive. And maybe that's why they're blindsided when it happens. Uh, they're more concerned about Matt and his journalistic background and the fact he's a journal and now they have to do something about it. And then they end up having to go back into a major fight. And then that sets up this kind of final row that Millwall are due to play West Ham for the first time in 10 years. That turns out to be a complete MacGuffin. Like, we're kind of expecting that we're going to get to see maybe the match and the guys, you know, might have to fight on the way to the game or after the game or something like that. But instead, it just turns out that one of the guys in the Green Street crew has a mate who seems to operate somewhere right beside the Millennium Dome, yeah. which means you can put the Millennium Dome in the background. Like, I love it's almost this movie almost feels like because it was a kind of a joint American and Anglo project. It's almost like something made by Americans who felt, what do Americans know about London that we can actually use here? So as opposed to going to, say, somewhere in South London or, you know, in East London, with the exception of going to Upton Park, it's like, 
even when Bobber falls asleep, remember when he has that kind of moment of yeah, conscience? Yeah, it's uh, the London Bridge. He's on. The, he's like basically on a bench on the London Bridge with everything <laughs> in the background. And you may as well have like put him up in front of Big Ben. And then obviously for the fight itself, they managed to get the Millennium Dome into the background. So it, it's very clear. It's like, let's just keep on reinforcing to the Americans that they're in the middle of London. And then obviously the final scrap is able to happen there. Like it's remarkably handy to have a mate who can arrange an area where the police are definitely not going to see you and where there's no cameras because that's a running theme throughout is that they can't get away with things because this is the most uh, surveillance TV in the world is in London. But yet they managed to find a building site which is entirely empty for them to have a big scrap. Listen, Will, they also managed to burn down an entire pub and stab a fella in the neck with the, without the police so what, so much as turning <laughs> up. So I, I, reckon, I, I reckon they were all right doing this in public, never mind uh, trying to get a place out in private. I do really like the final scene though I have to say I like the build up to it the music's great uh, Matt walking down the street and deciding he's going to do it I, I think the build up to it's brilliant it's really gritty the fighting is like the fight scenes are actually pretty good despite the, th the fact that several people should have died but it ends with a really dramatic scene and the sound of it still will always haunt me the, the sound of Tommy Hatcher beating the numb face of Pete Dunham because he's dead already. He's broken his neck with a headbutt, and it's probably it, it, it's as dramatic a finale as you'll get from one of these movies. Sometimes you get a happy ending with these, but this is just it, there's no happy ending in it. No, and to be honest, the first time I saw this, I think I saw this in the cinema actually back when it came out, was that I was so shocked with what happened because you're kind of thinking if anyone's getting out of this fight. It's surely going to be the two characters who we have spent the last 90 minutes with, that surely Matt and Pete are going to survive, no matter what else happens. Maybe some of the henchmen or the right-hand men, or maybe Bover might end up um, having to give his life as a chance to actually redeem himself. But instead, we lose the main character within the movie in the most horrific way possible. Um, OK, he gets to go out by giving a sacrifice because in many ways he probably buys time for Matt, his sister, and the child to get out because... Again, I really don't understand why she was on the way to the airport and on her way to Boston and she decided to drive to this fight and how she even knew where the fight was happening. But she turns up, puts herself in the middle of danger. Uh, the main Millwall henchman manages to stop the Range Rover from getting away. Uh, Bover has to come over to try and get the save initially. And then when it's very clear that the bad guys, if we want to call them that, are about to descend on the Range Rover, he has to do something to try and distract Tommy, and it's basically, come and finish me off. And at that point, he's already in a pretty bad way. Like, he's already, I think he's got a stab uh, just below his ribs. He's really struggling to walk, and you know that he's not going to be able to defend himself. But still, I thought something was going to come in and break it up. I didn't think Pete was going to end up being beaten to death. And that's the thing, when he hits the ground, you hear this horrible crunch, and then, effectively, he's indefensible, he's on the ground, and you just hear multiple, probably five or six very heavy smacks hit him in the face, yeah. and we've got him dead. And at that point, the firms just seem to stop fighting. Like, it's it's kind of a, a really, really strange moment, but one I did not see coming at all. Well, I don't think anybody's seen it coming, but what's more annoying is, like we touched on earlier on, the point of this should be that there is no good side to this violence. There's no way to justify it. These people are normal people that are driven by violence. They should have ended the movie there. They shouldn't have. Yeah. They, so they, they, that should have been the moral of the story, that this guy was a school teacher who was caught up in something bigger than him and that he gave his life for it. But the ending then turns out to be Matt going back to Boston and facing up to his troubles and using his now hard man persona, having, having gone through all of this, he's able to finally stand up to the guy in Harvard. That was a really stupid ending or a stupid decision from the director, in my opinion. Yeah, it's horrifically corny. Like, what you need there is you need a studio or an editor probably to stand up to the director who was also the screenwriter because you have to go, right, the, the final scene really should be maybe even fade to black at the point when we realise that Pete is there face up dead on the ground and everyone who's fighting has actually stopped. Like, that could be the moral story. It's like we've gone too far here. Like, I know there's a child that's been killed previously, but this is this kind of really horrific moment, and we get to see Tommy go absolute animal uh, when he's killing him. It's almost like it should be a realisation for both firms that's like, OK, we enjoy a dust-up and a scrap, but Jesus, we've gone too far here. That would have actually been a fairly impactful ending. 
it's the fact that, yeah, we go, then we arrive back in Boston and he meets his former roommate who's doing cocaine in the toilet. So obviously he hasn't learned from his previous errors. And then, you know, cleverly, he's using his journalistic training or the five out of six credits he may have picked up at Harvard uh, to covertly tape somebody and says that he's going to use this with the Harvard board if needed uh, to get back in. And we're meant to kind of celebrate that idea that, you know, he's going to go back and actually finish his degree, which brings us back to that first point. It's like, am I meant to care that Matt got kicked out of college? Am I meant to care that he's going to go back to college? Do I feel that he's really gone on a journey and learned an interesting life message in terms of his arc? I don't know if he really has. And then he comes out of what was a restaurant, I think it was, and he's uh, singing Blowing Bubbles and kind of celebrating everything that happened with the firm. It's really weird because you got to remember too that Matt, and this is a very short movie, but Matt has only been to one football match with the firm. Yeah. Matt has only sang this song once and now it appears to have a profound effect on his life. It, it's weird. We don't spend enough time actually with the crew at games. That's one thing if you could go back and remake this movie and thank God we don't have to review the sequel to this but if you if you did go back and remake it that's one thing i would definitely do i would have had them going to more football games and built up kind of that relationship outside of the fighting and let millwall be this big fight let spurs at the start be this big fight but have it that the relationship actually grows like there's no way that elijah woods weak or whatever he had in england is going to have that profound an effect that now he's going to sit down and watch west ham and all the life lessons he learned are going to make him some kind of badass in america yeah, it's just such a bizarre ending and, like you said, the relationship he's built up. How long do you reckon has passed since his friend died? I mean, two weeks, three weeks? When did he go back to Harvard? It's just... it's Pro such... Probably probably about, about that long. Like, I mean, he can't have been in England all that long because the impression they give is genuinely a couple of days, goes to the Birmingham game, definitely has a night on the couch, has a couple of days where he meets up with Pete... And they have that very funny scene where the nine-year-old children are knocking goals past That's them. That's my favourite scene. It's just so, what, like, so funny. What, what are they, <laughs> Olympic hoofles? No, they're just regular boys. It's like, uh, that, that's another one. It's like, damn, these English people really like football. And also, I kind of wonder, like, as you said, you saw the behind the scenes on this. Did West Ham have some kind of involvement on an official level? Because... Obviously, they've got the West Ham footage and they allowed them to shoot within Upton Park. And I'm guessing they must have been allowed to set up extra cameras for the really cool footage that they got of the game. And then the kids in that PE class are wearing full home and away West Ham kits. Like, I assumed when they were reaching into the bag, one team are going to wear bibs and one team are going to wear their regular gear. Oh, no, kids. they're in they're in tight player fit West Ham jerseys. I think it's more a Reebok deal than a West Ham Deal. Uh, I can't. Yeah. I can't say for certain, but I'm nearly sure I read something about that. That because Reebok were the sponsors of West Ham at that point, so it sort of tied in with that. So you, you touched on that. Let's talk about some of the best scenes in this before we wrap up. So you have the football match between the kids, which is brilliant. Um, I I love the uh, the deep dive into the Cockney rhyme and slang, or <laughs> not so much the deep dive as as the uh, five minute rehearsal before we go into the pub it just it's silly it's stupid it's not really accurate but it just adds to the sort of air of this movie it does and like i did a very quick search while you were thinking there for where charlie hunnam is from i had a feeling he was probably from the north of england as opposed to being from london he's from newcastle so that probably makes a lot of sense and i think even at the point when you went to make this movie i think he'd already gone to america at that point like he'd been in queer as folk and I think he was in an American series called Undeclared before this happened. So he was living in the States. And there's an American twang even from time to time within his Cockney, which I think is probably just that he's been learning a more neutral American accent along the way. And then you hear the, the Cockney rhyming scheme. It's just absolutely hilarious. And it's like, as you say, it's literally a 30 second. Uh, here's all you need to know. And I think Elijah Wood managed to use one or two of those phrases within the conversation in some kind of attempt to keep it going. Beans and then we get for money. That's it. Yeah, give me, give me some bees and honey. Like it's just, again, it's hilarious. This is what I mean. It's like if you were, say, you were making, if aliens were making a movie about a gang warfare football event happening in England, this is probably what aliens would make because they would read a book or maybe even watch Green Street and they think that this is reality and this is what they would present back. Like it's, I wonder how many English people were actually on this crew, with the exception of the actors who seem to turn up in all of these movies. I'd say not too many. So, ratings out of 10, Will, or ratings out of 100 on <laughs> Rotten Tomatoes, it has 47%. 
7.5 stars out of 10 on IMDb, which is pretty good. We've been wow. averaging around about six to six to eight in our last five movies. Lowest has been four and a half. So where are you putting this? Yeah, so basically what seems to happen on this ending, because I had a quick look this morning as well to see where this was rated, because for me, this is probably like for cringe factor and for like bad movie. And this is what happens when you watch a movie like The Room. It's like critically, I would put it way down like a two or a three. But for just entertainment value and some of the scenes in it, I'd probably put it around a seven or an eight. And that's kind of where I would stand. But it's funny, this movie appears to have been really well received in America. And I'm presuming that's probably largely why we have that final scene with Elijah Wood and him singing the bubble song as he comes out of a restaurant in Boston. Like Roger Ebert gave this movie three stars out of four. He's been known to give like, you know, best pictures two out of four. He's usually quite a tough uh, critic to actually please, but he seemed to really like this. And the consensus among the American critics seemed to be that they were really entertained. So maybe we're just the wrong target market for this when it comes to critical acclaim. Uh, yeah, I, I think as a movie, probably about a three, but if oh, you want to be entertained, oh. I reckon about a seven. Wow. So where are you putting it? Uh, I think maybe seven. maybe split the difference and call it a five then. That's three. That's awful. Well, to be we, fair, if you're going on critical... critical the, movie's, <laughs> the movie is awful, but that's why we enjoy it. Yeah, to be fair, I'm putting this in the brackets of the Fast and Furious franchise and those sort of movies where you hate yourself for loving them, but you love them nonetheless. And... I, do you know what? I'm giving this a 7.5 out of 10 because oh. I have I loved watching this film as a youngster. Uh, I thought it was silly throughout and I love it even more. I watched it again before we did this and I'm probably going to watch it again soon enough. It's one of those movies that I can sit down and watch at any point in time. Yeah, look, again, I as I said at the very outset, I enjoyed sitting down to watch it this morning and it absolutely flew by. I actually, for some reason in my mind, I thought the film was a little bit longer. And at one point I took a pause to go get a coffee and I realized we're an hour in and the movie was nearly over. I was like, oh wow, this is just absolutely breezed by. So the message here, listeners to Team 33, is that End of Call is not the man to watch an art house movie at Cannes, but he'll very happily watch Green Street five times. And I'm more than happy to endorse that as well. Listen, anybody who knows me knows me or knows that I... I'm not a man that sits down and watches a three-hour movie. I will happily sit and watch Adam Sandler movies and Owen Wilson movies <laughs> back to back, no problem, no questions asked. But that is Green Street or Green Street Hooligans if you're listening in the US. That has been Team 33. Will O'Callaghan, thanks very much for joining me. Thanks, and enjoyed it. We'll take a quick break. Connor Clancy is up after the break. <laughs> 